Ever wonder what Christianity was like under the apostles? Here's Tony Bosserman to give you a glimpse into original Christianity. The Apostles' Creed. 1.2 billion Catholics around the world embrace it as their statement of belief, along with the Nicene Creed and the Chalcedon Creed. But is the Apostles' Creed apostolic? Does it really represent what the original Christians and the Apostles believed? Now, the word creed comes from the Latin word credo, and it means I believe. Did you know that there's almost 200 statements in your Bible that say, I believe, I believe this or I believe that? And of course, many of them are made by the apostles and the prophets. And so a list could be compiled of what they believe, and we would know what the Christian faith is all about. Have you ever studied your congregation or your denomination's statement of belief? Some churches call it an articles of faith. But either way, have you taken the time to study it, to really see if it represents what the Bible actually says? And how about your statement of belief? Has it changed? Has it been altered? Has it grown? You know, the Bible says we're to grow in grace and knowledge in 2 Peter 3, verse 18. And yet, most statement of beliefs of different churches down through the centuries have been stagnant. They haven't changed at all. They haven't been updated. In fact, they're considered a closed creed. And so how does a church grow in grace and knowledge if it never reviews what it teaches? Now, the Encyclopedia of Religion tells us there's 33,000 different denominations of Christianity, and that means there's 33,000 different statement of beliefs. So which one is right? Which one is most representative of the Christian faith. Well, this is the topic of today's edition of Original Christianity. Now, if you go to the Bible, you're not going to find the word creed, but you will find the phrase, the faith. That's right, it's there dozens of times, and that's the way the apostles referred to that collective teaching that constitutes the Christian faith. And so maybe you've never studied those texts. Let's take a look at a few of them together today. If you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, it says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. So again, how many Christians ever examine themselves as to whether they are in the faith, the biblical faith, the Christian faith that is outlined in the pages of your Bible? You know, it's something we're supposed to do annually before we take the cup, before we take the bread. I'm talking, of course, about the Lord's Supper. And so the Apostle Paul said we were to examine ourselves. And in this case, specifically, whether you are in the faith and test yourselves, it says. So these are very important statements and texts in the Bible. Let's take a look at another one in Titus chapter 1 and verse 1. This is the opening statement of Paul to Titus. He says, Paul, a bondservant of God, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth. So here's one of the places in the Bible that we see the faith and the truth. And so they're synonymous. It's equating the two. That's what Paul, the Apostle Paul is doing here. And he's showing us that the faith is the truth. In other words, Genesis to Revelation, what the Bible teaches us. Now, you might be surprised to learn, and again, I challenge you to look at your congregation or your denomination statement of beliefs, and you might find that there are many statements there that are not right out of the pages of your Bible. In other words, they're uh, theologic speak. They're humanly worded phrases and ideas and concepts. And so, of course, they don't represent really the original Christian faith. And isn't that what we're after? Well, that's what this program is all about. If you look at Jude, verse 3, there's only one chapter there. It says, I, Jude, found it necessary to write to you, the church, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. So the faith was once for all delivered to the saints. We don't need to change it. We don't need to alter it. 
but we do need to frame it. In other words, we need to gather the texts that are in the Bible about various topics, about the major teachings or doctrines of the Bible, of the Christian faith, and we need to put them together. And this has been one of my complaints about statement of beliefs of many, many churches. Why can't they just lift the text right out of the Bible on whatever subject it is, whatever doctrine it is, and put it in there as their statement of beliefs? In other words, there are enough definitive statements out there about the nature of God, about how to worship God, about various teachings of the Bible that we don't need to add to them. We don't need to somehow summarize them. All we need to do is list them right there in our statement of beliefs. And yet very few churches do this. If you take the time, as I have, to look at very many of the uh, statement of beliefs of different churches, you're going to find, again, a lot of theological speak and a lot of different human wording instead of just lifting the text on a subject and putting in there as your statement of beliefs. So this text in Jude 3 is very important because it tells us that we are earnestly to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. In other words, the original faith, and thus the name of this program, the original Christianity. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 says this, Guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed, and in doing so have departed from the faith. So again, once we get into the human realm of thinking, of philosophy, and bringing you know, different ideas and concepts to the Bible instead of from the pages of the Bible, then we err, and we go away from the faith. And that's what Paul is warning against right here. There is knowledge that is falsely called knowledge, and yet people don't know about it. And that's because Satan has deceived the entire world, according to Revelation 12, verse 9. Turn with me to Revelation 14 and verse 12. It says, Here is the patient of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, it doesn't say faith in Jesus. It says the faith of Jesus. Well, that's because Jesus had a collective body of understanding that he shared with others in the Sermon on the Mount and, of course, many other occasions. So the faith of Jesus, don't we want to know what that is? Well, again, it's outlined in the pages of your Bible. In fact, most of you have a red-letter edition of the Bible, and so that would be the faith of Jesus. So what did Jesus teach on the nature of God? What did he teach on worship? What did he teach about tithing? What did he teach about you know, different subjects that we take for granted in the Christian faith? Few people have ever asked themselves those questions and pursued Jesus' answer to those questions. And so that's what I challenge you to do. Come up with your own statement of beliefs, but write from the pages of the Bible. In other words, look for those different texts on a subject and compile them and say, okay, this is what I believe. But a few Christians ever take the time to do this. And again, you will benefit immensely by doing it because you will then have a better understanding. It'll be more crystal clear what you believe, what you stand for, and what you are a part of when you say, I'm a Christian. And let's turn to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, where the Apostle Paul says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So there's a statement, a command actually, from the Apostle Paul that we should all be speaking the same thing. And yet again, as I said, there's 33,000 different denominations of Christianity giving a conflicting account of what the Bible really says. So how do we all speak the same thing? How do we get back to one message? Well, you may not have heard of it, but there has been a restoration movement going on for the last couple hundred years in this world, in the world of Christianity. 
Maybe you've never heard of the Restoration Bible, but it's out there. The Restoration Bible returns or restores the name of God to the text. Instead of reading just the Lord, it says Yahweh. Now, again, we don't know if that's the exact pronunciation, but isn't it better to have the name, at least some version of the name in there, instead of the Lord? So that's one attempt at restoration, at getting back to the original message. There are many others that have occurred. In fact, let me read this quote to you from a theologian named Rubel Shelley. He says, quote, The motive behind all restoration movements is to tear down the walls of separation. He's talking about the separation between denominations by a return to the practice of the original, essential, and universal features of the Christian religion. So that's quite a statement, isn't it? To me, it sounds a lot like what we just read in 1 Corinthians 1.10, that we should all speak the same thing. How do we get there? By going back to the original message. And here's another quote, the unification of all Christians in a single body patterned after the church of the New Testament is what the restoration movement is all about. So you can be part of the restoration movement. Don't you want to get back to original Christianity, the Christianity that both the apostles and Jesus himself observed and practiced? You know, that's the pure Christianity. What came later was altered and added to. And of course, there's a whole study in theology called hermeneutics. And in hermeneutics, there are rules of interpreting Scripture. Can you imagine if we got a cardinal from the Catholic Church, and if we got a Lutheran pastor, and we got somebody else from the Orthodox Church, and maybe some of the several uh, major churches, and put them in a room together and paid them for a year to just talk about each doctrine of the Bible and to come out with a collective, unified statement, but just scriptures, only texts from the Bible, again, about who and what God is, what is worship, you know, what are we supposed to do as Christians, what's required of of us, and just lay it out there so that there would be one statement of belief that all Christian denominations could embrace. Is that possible? Well, I'm sure saying the devil would do everything he could to keep it from happening, to make sure that it isn't representative of original Christianity, of the truth. And there's some sayings that have come out of this movement. You might have heard of this one. In essentials, unity. In opinions, liberty. In all things, love. Now, the Apostle Paul said we should speak the truth in love. In other words, if we have differences of opinion... Well, we should still uh, express those opinions in love and consideration for one another. And so these are things that we can work on as different Christian denominations to try to fulfill that command in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, that we all speak the same thing. Now, we also need to understand that there is a movement in theological circles called continuity versus discontinuity. In other words, what did continue from the Old Testament to the New Testament and what was discontinued? We'll talk about that right after this. No one would deny that a major part of the COVID-19 effect has been to bring an eerie silence over the earth throughout much of 2020. Empty streets, business offices, churches, schools, stadiums and parks, with billions of people sheltering in place, have dramatically lowered the decibel level generated by human beings throughout the world. Another part of the COVID-19 effect has been to greatly curb people's activity levels, resulting in an unparalleled, restful state in cities and countries everywhere. In retrospect, the year 2020 may be dubbed the year the Earth stood still. What most people are not aware of is that this COVID-19 effect was foretold in advance over 2,500 years ago, and it is the first of eight major events to come It was all revealed by the most accurate political forecaster in the history of mankind. Read Foretold and find out what's coming after the COVID-19 effect. To order your copy of Foretold the COVID-19 effect, visit OriginalChristianityReview.com or find us on Amazon. 
We've been talking about creeds. We've been talking about articles of faith, the different collective statement of beliefs that 33,000 different denominations of Christianity have. And again, you may not be familiar with yours. You've never read it. You've never studied it. But you do have the opportunity to do so. Ask your pastor where you can find it. It might be posted online at your church's website. But all of us should study the statement of beliefs that we are a part of. We should know what it is that we are a part of and that what we represent is from the pages of the Bible. Ask the tough questions. Has our church statement of beliefs ever changed? Has it ever been modified? Has it ever been updated? Again, if we're going to grow in grace and knowledge as Christians, then these things need to happen where we re uh, discuss and we relook at some of these different teachings that we've just taken for granted are from the pages of the Bible. And so in the Bible, we look to the fact that uh, we don't find the word creed, but we do find the phrase, the faith. And it's found there dozens of different times. We looked at some of the different texts. And so now let's talk about continuity versus discontinuity. You know, Jesus said in John 10, verse 35, that Scripture cannot be broken. And so, of course, he's likening it to a chain. And a chain, of course, is linked. And, of course, that chain is linked through similar, uh, consistent statements. And so the point is that nothing in the book of Numbers or Deuteronomy or Proverbs should contradict something that's in Matthew or in Ephesians or Philippians. In other words, you would expect that if Almighty God does not change, well, then why would his message change? And this is one of the great things about the Bible. It is such a cohesive document. In other words, there have been 66 books, of course, that compiled together make the Bible. And there's been many different authors, and they've lived in different time periods. And of course, they come from many different backgrounds, and yet it is a cohesive message from Genesis to Revelation. That's remarkable. In fact, it's a miracle. It could only have been accomplished by God and his spirit. And so there is a continuity, not a discontinuity in Scripture. And so we find in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, this summary statement. You, speaking to the Gentiles, and of course he was speaking to the church at Ephesus, are no longer strangers and foreigners. And that's the way the Gentiles were looked at by Jews, but no longer. Because now they are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of what? the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So that statement shows that the Bible is a continuity, that the church is built on what the prophets wrote in the Old Testament and, of course, what the apostles wrote in the New Testament. And so, again, it is a cohesive, coherent message that the Holy Spirit actually inspired. Now, if you go to Acts chapter 24 and verse 14, the apostle said, Paul says this, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things written in the law and in the prophets. So the apostle Paul believed everything that was written in the law and the prophets, and yet so many Christian denominations rarely ever read the Old Testament from the pulpit. You know, they really actually teach that, you know, it's abrogated, it's done away with, it's no longer applicable or obligatory upon Christians. And yet here's the Apostle Paul saying he believes all things written in the Law of the Prophets. He embraces the God of his fathers. And yet we have New Testament theologians painting a completely different portrait of who and what God is. And so we need, as Christians, to take a fresh look at what we believe, what our churches believe, what our statement of belief is in our church or congregation, and really ask the tough questions. Is this a biblically worded statement, or again, is this theological speak? So those are some of the questions we need to ask ourselves 
rules, rituals, and beliefs of Jesus and the Jews continued as the Christian faith. That's what we see in the pages of your Bible. It wasn't that we had a set of beliefs in the Old Testament that then were updated and somehow abrogated or done away with by a whole new set of teachings in the New Testament. No, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So, for instance, let's take a look at a couple of examples of continuity in doctrine. Malachi 2 verse 10 says, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? And of course, among the Jewish community, even to this day, they believe in one God. And of course, he is called a father figure, even in the Old Testament. And then in 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6, the Apostle Paul confirms this, saying, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, and one Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a continuity here. Remember, the Apostle Paul said that he worshipped the God of his fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And of course, the concept of that God being one and being the Father alone did not change. There's no record of the New Testament to Christians coming out with a different concept, a different teaching on the nature of God. The Trinity is nowhere discussed. It is not found, stated in the pages in the New Testament. In fact, the word Trinity doesn't even appear in the history till about 180 A.D. And so again, there is a continuity of statements about who and what God is in your Bible. And yet, we have been taught differently. How about Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 6? It says, Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. That's the Old Testament. And so God's disciples are those who are observing his law. And what does the New Testament say? Well, James chapter 1 verse 25 says, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and there's a continuity statement in itself, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man will be blessed in what he does. So that shows that the perfect law of liberty in the New Testament continues. It continues for all Christians. And of course, this is consistent with what Jesus himself said when he said in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets, I have come to rather fulfill them. And of course, he did. He kept every jot and tittle of the law. And he kept it as our example. And then he went on to say that those who teach the commandments of God and live by them are going to be called greatest in the kingdom of God. But those who teach they're done away with somehow, they're no longer obligatory, well, they're going to be called least in the kingdom of God. So how about you? You want to be called least or greatest? And, of course, many Christian denominations, practically all of them, teach that the law was nailed to the cross. And so where does that leave the Ten Commandments? Well, again, most Christian denominations embrace at least nine of those Ten Commandments. It's the Sabbath that they don't want to embrace. And yet, what do we find in the New Testament? We find the New Testament church meeting on the Sabbath, even Gentile congregations coming together. Notice this in Acts 17, verse 2. It says, Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Now, what does the word custom mean? It means something that continues. It means something that's done over and over again from generation to generation. And so the Apostle Paul's custom was the observance of the Sabbath. And so, you know, the original church met in the synagogues. And that's because, again, there's really only one religion in the pages of your Bible, and that is God's religion. You know, it's man that makes different sects or denominations out of one religion. And so there are today at least five major sects of of Judaism. And, of course, there's, again, 33,000 different denominations of Christianity. But those are man-made, not God-made. And so God would have us get back together and all speak the same thing. How do we do that? 
We go back to Luther's version or John Calvin's. Do we go back to Augustine? You know, really the only way that we could get back to something everyone could agree on is to get back to the original, and that is outline of the pages of the Bible. And so we need to look at how the original Christians were worshiping. You know, what system did they worship by? And we need to get back to that system. We need to understand what they taught about who and what God is. And so a statement of beliefs can be lifted right from the pages of the Bible. We don't need to have any theologic speak or human wording. It can come right from Scripture. And I challenge you to do so for your own sake, for your family's sake. You know, try to bring together the different texts of the Bible on each major doctrine. You know, it'll probably be a year or two long project for you, but it will reflect what you believe the Bible really says about your religion. So according to the Apostle Paul, then, the church is cleansed through the washing of water by the word. That's in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26. So how do we get back to original Christianity? Well, we cleanse everything we've been taught by the Word. If it's not of the Word, well, then we don't teach it. We don't practice it. And so that's how we could get back to one system of belief as the body of Christ, as the church. And then we can give a much more unified uh, projection of what the truth is to the world. Now, Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, we don't have time to read them, but take the time and see that God has not cast away his people, that we, the Gentiles, are being grafted in among the olive tree, which is Israel. And so there's a metaphor that the Apostle Paul uses that Israel's like an olive tree, and we, the Gentiles, are being grafted in among them. Well, look at the history of Christianity. What have we done? We've persecuted the Jews. There's been a lot of anti-Semitism. Many don't know that Martin Luther wrote a book entitled The Jews and Their Lies. And the Hitler regime used that book to justify some of their treatment of the Jews. No, the Jews are the root. And the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 11 that we, the branches that are being grafted in, should not boast against the Jews, for they're the root and we're the branches. So if we want to get back to one system of belief, you know, one denomination of Christianity, well, then we need to do what the Bible says. And we need to go back to original Christianity rather than all of these different forms of Christianity that developed later on. So I hope you go to OriginalChristianityReview.com and take the time maybe to study some of the statement of beliefs that's there. We have a statement of beliefs that is posted that is only the words of Jesus Christ. So remember, if original Christianity was good enough for Jesus and the apostles, it should be good enough for you and me. Thanks for watching.